What's up? This is Jay Dyer from Jay's Analysis. One of the most requested videos that I've not gotten around to doing, it's high time we did it, and that is the top 15, and maybe one or two honorable mentions, orthodox theological books that I've really found relevant over the years. And it's hard to narrow it down. Obviously, there's a lot that should and could go into this stack, but I really had to think about the ones that were the most uh, influential in my journey and in my thought process and, and addressed, you know, specific topics and issues. And oh, I forgot one more. This one definitely has to be on the list. So let's get into it. Um, I'll do the first 15 and then, you know, one or two of the honorable mentions. And <clears throat> certainly the Bible could be included. Uh, you know, the Orthodox Study Bible is, is the, the best Bible in my opinion. Uh, but I'm going to focus just on the theological text. Uh, this is not focusing on prayer and liturgical text. That's kind of a separate um, video that could be made. So this is just going to focus on <clears throat> the strict theological text because, of course, theology was one of my key interests and still is. And that's one of the things that led me uh, to choosing orthodoxy after many years of comparing Protestant, Roman Catholic, and even other perennial tradition, you know, Neoplatonic uh, philosophies and so forth, to see, you know, where I really thought the best arguments lied. So, the first uh, text that really hit me, <clears throat> and this is one that I think was the best critique of the classical Western view of divine simplicity, and how Aristotle is seen differently in Orthodox theology as opposed to Latin theology, especially by the Middle Ages, this is Dr. David Bradshaw's book, Aristotle, East and West. Now, <clears throat> this text does require quite a bit of academic knowledge to begin with. So it's certainly not, so it's certainly not a beginner text. It, it, it presupposes a good deal of knowledge of philosophical terms and ideas, and particularly Aristotle. I think the toughest chapters in this book are going to be the first two or three. So if you get bogged down, uh, be sure and power through and make your way into the latter chapters, particularly the chapters dealing with the energies and St. Gregory Palamas, because those are really, uh, the, that's the meat of this book, of this text, and that's one of the reasons it's so important and why, you know, I had Dr. Bradshaw on and we've done interviews and, and, and chats on this topic because it was such a, a, such a key text in my journey. Next, I would say uh, is, and these aren't in any specific order, they're all kind of, uh, had varying degrees of influence depending upon the time and, and what my questions were at that time. The next book that was really influential was uh, the full text of St. John of Damascus, and I'm including the Fountain of Knowledge and the Philosophical Chapters, or excuse me, the, the Fountain of Knowledge is the Philosophical Chapters, uh, because that book, even though it's short, gives a good uh, overall definition to a lot of the philosophical terms that we use in orthodoxy, and most of those terms are Aristotelian. And so St. John Damascus was very much influenced by Aristotle, uh, probably more so than any of the other church fathers, although there is an influence in St. Maximus as well from Aristotle. Uh, but the philosophical chapters is great for an overview of orthodox philosophy. And then the uh, list of the heresies shows the uh, orthodox view of her heresies, including the world religions. And so, you know, paganism, Islam, for us, those can in a loose sense be called heresies as well because they're anti-Trinitarian views in the final analysis. And then, of course, on the orthodox faith is the most uh, famous classic orthodox systematic theology. And that's, of course, the most important section or, or part of this book. Um, it's its own book within this book four parts and you know book one gets into the uh, theology of God proper and it begins with the Trinitarian order of theology theology that the order of theology begins with the Trinity begins with the person of the father father the monarchy of the father and it uh, discusses uh, the essence energy distinction uh, right away in in the first book that same uh, distinction between essence and energy and the many energies is applied in book three throughout book three to Christology. And so we see that when John Damascus is restating the teaching of the Sixth Ecumenical Council, his interpretation, which is correct, of the Sixth Ecumenical Council, which affirms the work, the theological argumentation of St. Maximus the Confessor, is an explicit and profuse application of the essence energy distinction precisely in exactly the same way that the Byzantine theologians of the Middle Ages St. Gregory of Palamas, Gregory of Cyprus, etc., and the Palamite Sidons understood 
this distinction. And that rules out then, in my view, any Roman Catholic reading of John Damascus. So a very important text, very important to go through the whole of that text and not get bogged down in you know specific areas or details. So I highly recommend that. Um, next up would be, uh, you know, for me, the, the, the issue of uh, evolution was very problematic in that, uh, you know, to me, if you adopt evolutionary theory, I think that ultimately you're going to have to in some way end up denying dogmatic and theologically uh, correct teachings about Genesis, about the uh, history of the person of Adam and Eve, persons of Adam and Eve and the redemptive story of Christ, right? Because if the story of Adam and Eve isn't as it's described, uh, then Christ isn't the new Adam, right? So it really messes up the whole redemptive scheme and death ends up becoming something, quote, natural, all of which is foreign to Orthodox theology. If you read Romans 8, death is not natural. It's described as the enemy. And so uh, Father Seraphim Rose's book, Genesis Creation and Early Man, I think is a necessary theological text that accurately conveys the patristic consensus on Genesis. And um, although I don't condemn everybody that has a differing uh, opinion on Genesis, I think that that's the most consistent position. Next would be um, one of the texts that really changed my mind on how I viewed Christology. You know, I mentioned in the John Damascus text that he applies the essence energy distinction consistently to Christology. The other thing that uh, I never got when I was really heavily Latin in my theology, whether Protestant uh, or Roman Catholic, was the significance and the importance of Christ as a divine hypostasis. And the when we understand that that singular divine subject is identical to the pre-incarnate logos, same subject, same person, then we begin to understand that the Christological controversies that St. Cyril is engaged in, and by extension, the Fifth Council's reaffirmation of St. Cyril's understanding, particularly of Chalcedon, gives us really an antidote to a lot of Western mistakes that tend towards Nestorianism. And so this opened my mind up to the energies in Christ as well, because I actually read this before I read some of these other energy texts. And so I highly recommend St. Cyril of Alexander and the Christological Controversy by John McGuckin. By the way, uh, I'm not advocating every position of the authors of these texts either. So just because I cite a book does not mean that I'm saying that these people are good in every other area of their teachings. The next book that I read uh, that really changed my mind on certain things was uh, St. Maximus's approach in this little book, and of course I've read a lot of other Maximus texts since then, but this was my introduction, The Cosmic Mystery of Jesus Christ, and it really, uh, again, shows directly from Maximus himself the approach to understanding the Logi, to understanding the energies, the things around God, the distinction between essence and energy, the two wills and two energies in Christ, right, applied consistently throughout Maximus's writings, and particularly Ambiguum 7, which goes into a lot of detail about the divine ideas, uh, this was a big game changer for me. And it was a big uh, changer in terms, game changer in terms of understanding Christ's incarnation, death, burial, and resurrection is cosmic in scope. It's not limited in the sense of only saving the elect. There has to be a cosmic scope by which the uh, redemption even affects the natural order. And that's, again, the same cosmic scope mentioned in Romans 8 and in 1 Corinthians 15, where we read that Christ is the new Adam, and the death that Adam brought upon all will extend to all in the same scope in terms of Christ's redemption. That doesn't mean everyone's saved, but it means that the nature of everyone is restored. But their individual hypostasis, their personhood, that will determine their experience of the eschaton. The next book that uh, was a big game changer for me was the uh, a couple books from Vladimir Lossky. And these really helped me understand the intricacies of Orthodox theology um, proper, right? Uh, particularly Trinitarian theology, particularly um, the image of God, particularly iconography, particularly Christology, and the proper application of personhood to both anthropology and theology. And that would be the mystical theology of the Eastern Church and 
in the image and likeness of God. And on my channel, we have lectured through both of these books, by the way. So if you want a good overall introductions to Orthodox theology, you can't do better than starting with those two books. Next book that really affected me, especially when I was a Roman Catholic, was I read this twice uh, back in about 2007. Because at first, my first reading, I found it a little bit difficult because I was new to this, uh, you know, filioque question at a very minutia level. Um, and even though this is a short book, it does get pretty deep. And that is the uh, Mystagogy of the Holy Spirit by St. Photius. Of course, he's now um, revered as a saint in the Roman Catholic Church, even though he was for centuries considered a heretic. Um, now this book is, uh, I guess you could say, Catholic as well. So ironically, <laughs> the arguments against the Filioque uh, are somehow still now acceptable in Roman Catholic theology. But to me, this was really a, an eye-opener and a game-changer that um, I didn't really think, I kind of assumed that, well, Orthodox people, they don't really have a good case for Filioque. It's not that big of a deal. It's just kind of a, you know a side issue, but I didn't really understand the interconnectedness of filioque to divine simplicity, to Neoplatonism, to an imbalance in the one and the many, to uh, creating a dyad in the Trinity instead of a triad. And so this opened up my, uh, my mind to orthodox critiques, and so I definitely recommend that one. And in concert with that text, another one of the most important texts was my um, introduction to St. Gregory Palamas which was dialogue between an Orthodox and a Barlamite. I also read the triads at the same time, but I feel like this one is more accessible to people than the triads would be. And this one is only about an 80, 80 page debate. Uh, there's a good introduction, a scholarly academic introduction in this version. And I recommend getting it if you want to get this one from SNUI Press, because if you try to order this on Amazon, it was uh, sold out for a long time out of print and copies were you know eight hundred dollars but it's only twenty dollars if you get it directly from snui press and you're going to get the best um down-to-earth presentation of arguing essence energy versus western theology um akandinos is the barley might he's the opponent in this debate and it's just an 80 page back and forth and you'll notice if you do go ahead and read it that a lot of the arguments that you hear me say in a lot of videos and talks i'm just repeating what's in here if you enjoyed this video, be sure and take use of the promo code for the show sponsor for this channel sponsor, which is chalk.com. That's C-H-O-Q.com. You can find the links in the description below the video. You get 50% off any of the great organic, actually better than organic supplements that they offer at chalk.com. If you want to support my channel, the best way to do that is to head on over there and use that promo code J50. That's J50 to get 50% off. You can also use the recurring subscription of J53LIFE, that's J53LIFE, if you want to sign up for automatic recurring subscriptions on those excellent supplements. Health is absolutely necessary in combating the toxic culture that we live in. I also would say if you want to get access to my books, head on over to the shop at my website and get signed copies there. Thank you. Nothing new, really. And, of course, you know, in Orthodox theology, we don't want to invent new things. We don't want to do the new. Another uh, theological text that is one of the most important for me, and this helped me understand the importance of Revelation. I don't think I would have become Orthodox if I hadn't read this book. Uh, so this book is one of the, the most important for convincing me of Orthodox theology because it actually dealt with a lot of the Western presuppositions and objections and concerns that I had. And so I'm so glad that I read uh, Father Demetrius Daniloy's Experience of God, Volume 1. And uh, it also is not um, an easy text. I think you will find it difficult when you get into it, uh, especially the you know 50 or 60 pages or so uh, that deal with the philosophy of time. Um, but most of the arguments that you hear me make about the one and the many, the logi, uh, the, the centrality of uh, the logos as a divine hypostasis, um, He's the first Orthodox theologian to write a systematic theology because this is, I think, a five or six part series. This is volume one. He's the first Orthodox theologian in the modern world in the 20th century to really integrate the doctrine of the Logi and the energies into his systematic theology. And so for me, this uh, you know solved so many quandaries and theological questions that I had for so many years. And so it's definitely a must have. Along the lines of the Photius text was another text that I read in 2008 
Um, and I just recently got my own, my, my own new copy because uh, I read it when I was a research assistant uh, at grad school or undergrad. I don't remember. I was probably undergrad at that time. Um, but I checked it out of the library and I, and I took it home and I read this as well as uh, some of the works of uh, Father Meyendorf. And uh, you can't go wrong with the Phocian Schism because Father Francis Dvornik, although he was a uniate, uh, he did quite a bit of work in revising the Roman attitude towards Photius. And so I think you could even argue that the only reason that St. Photius is now a saint in the Roman Catholic Church is due to the work of Dvornik. <laughs> so, although I, to me that's a clear contradiction in uh, you know the teaching of Rome to reverse their stance on something that should have been you know clearly dogma for centuries, saying the teaching of Photius is false. If you can flip that, then I mean, can the teaching of anybody else in the Roman Catholic Church has been condemned as a heretic? Can it be flipped as well? Can Nestorius become a saint? It appears that some of the Roman Catholics do allow the reverencing of Nestorius now. Can Arius be reverenced as well down down the road? Um, so, in other words, this really is important for vindicating a lot of the Orthodox claims from a Roman Catholic Uniate scholar, and he's uh, you know one of the most famous Uniate scholars of the 20th century. So, you can't go wrong with the Phocian Schism. Um, in concert with that, one of the most important texts that I read, uh, I was already Orthodox uh, when I read this, but. It is an important text, and I highly recommend uh, the, the classic by Edward Shashinsky on the Filioque. And I think he wrote this when he was a uniate as well. I think, if I recall, he has since become Orthodox. But this book uh, really vindicates, again, most of, most of the Orthodox arguments. It doesn't argue that every church father agreed wholesale with the, the Orthodox position. Yes, uh, Augustine teaches the Filioque for sure. Um, but the overall analysis really, again, kind of like the, Fo the, the Photian Schism book by Father Dvornik, um, it vindicates our position. So uh, it's a great text to have in this overall discourse. Uh, another one that was really a great overall, it's, it's not going to get super deep, but it will cover the big main topics. And it's great for an introduction to, of course, the papacy issue is the classic by Michael Welton, Two Paths. Papal monarchy versus the collegial tradition. And you're going to get an overview of the history of the papacy. You're going to get the boiled down essential arguments about how Vatican I contradicts the ancient can councils, how Vatican II contradicts the traditional pre Vatican II papal teachings on ecumenism and so forth. All that's going to be very well compacted uh, in a book written by people who were former traditional Catholics. Uh, so you can't go wrong with that. Uh, another great one uh, that recently came out that I read some some years back because uh, I was given by Father Here's an advanced copy and was really honored to have that. And it just really solidifies the impossibility of blending Palamas with Latin theology primarily because this whole treatise uh, on the procession of the Holy Spirit, the apodictic treatise of St. Gregory Palamas, now in English uh, in, in print, uh, vindicates the uh, the anti-ecumenist stance. Uh, you know, he begins the work by calling the Latins heterodox and satanic. He calls that he says they listen to Satan in their teaching, and uh, it's really just building on the mystagogy. So what Saint Gregory Palamas does in this book is just take all the arguments in this book and expand them, and utilize many principles of Aristotelian logic. So he's taking logic proper formal logic and applying it to all of these Trinitarian arguments. And that's a great vindication for so many of the pietistic people out there who say that you shouldn't do uh, the logic has nothing to do with the, with the theology. Apologetics is something that we don't do in orthodoxy. And why are you studying all this philosophy? Well, these are the people who I'm following, right? The greatest saints of the Orthodox church followed and studied Aristotelian logic, philosophy, etc and make made the same arguments that I made. So it really just speaks to the ignorance of a lot of the people in our sphere, unfortunately, who for m virtue signaling reasons want to say, oh, you're bad because you talk about theology and philosophy. Well, all of the people that I'm citing did that exact same thing. Another key text that's very important because it showed to me not just arguments for icon uh, iconographic uh, representations or iconodualism, because I was already, uh, even when I was Roman Catholic, you know, I supported the idea of images. I wasn't a, an iconoclast Protestant anymore. But I didn't understand the interconnectedness between the doctrine of the energies and icons. 
I didn't understand the connections between Christology and icons. And St. Theodore the Studite's little book on the holy icons, as well as St. John Damascus' defense of the divine images, uh, which is both of these works were cited at the Seventh Ecumenical Council and really helped to solidify uh, the orthodoxy of the iconodual position dogmatically. Both of these books uh, are great, but this one is just so great for integrating all of the previous Christological argumentation. And if you read that book, you'll come to realize that you can't separate Christology from iconography. A couple, uh, let's see, I think I got one more and then maybe a couple mentions. Um, this classic text by St. Justin Popovich, Orthodox Faith and Life in Christ, firstly because uh, the essay that deals with the critique of natural theology, and this is one of the great vindications of the stuff that I've said for so long, that the Orthodox don't do natural theology the way that the Latins do, and you know a lot of people got upset with that, that I was making it up. No, I'm just getting it from this. I'm just repeating what our saints say. Likewise, um, he has great critiques throughout this book of papalism uh, at a philosophical, cultural, geopolitical level. So all of those things are also uh, very key, very relevant, and very necessary if you want to understand uh, Orthodox theology. A couple more, uh, maybe one honorable mention and, and then another one that's good to have. Uh, I did read the whole text. Of course, it, it might be a little too dense because it is super philosophical, but Jaroslav Pelikan's book, Christianity and Classical Culture, The Metamorphosis of Natural Theology in the Christian Encounter with Hellenism, is a focus on the philosophical approach of the Cappadocians. So you'll notice that he's got the Cappadocians on the front. And it's a, uh, an analysis of, of both the philosophy and the theology of the Cappadocians. So you will get an introduction to all of those terms that you always hear us using, hypostasis, the energies, the logi, the one and the many. In fact, there's a whole chapter on the Trinity and the one and the many in this book. So I highly recommend that for an introduction to Cappadocian thinking. And the Cappadocians are so important for the Orthodox because for us, they really define the Trinity. I mean, it's their theology that is accepted at the Second Ecumenical Council, which settles Trinitarian theology all the way up until the Middle Ages. Then we get, of course, the full flourishing of the, the filioque dispute. But I'm saying at a dogmatic level, the Trinity doesn't become a theological dogmatic dispute until all the way up until the Council of Lyons for the Roman Catholics affirming the filioque and then the response of the Orthodox in terms of the Palamite councils against Lyons. And one other honorable mention, which I have done a video on, uh, a full video, uh, introduction to Orthodox Theology through Father Mayendorf's Byzantine Theology. And this book is great for uh, not just a theological presentation of the differences between East and West, but also history. So you'll get a lot of historical uh, uh, insight. You'll get a lot of references to iconoclast emperors, what was really going on in those iconoclast councils, what was the motivation, why was it Neoplatonism that was uh, uh, influencing the iconoclasts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All of that is going to be crucial if you want to understand Byzantine theology, and I highly recommend this text. If you want uh, more of my own ideas, uh, I would say go to my website and in the shop you can get my 660-page uh, book, Essays on Theology and Philosophy, where I do deal with a lot of Protestant arguments. I think there's two or 300 pages about Roman Catholic argumentation. And if you go to my website and get that book, it is signed copies. Of course, I have all my other books that are there too. I have the new Meta Narratives Philosophical Text which is just a little 200-page introduction to philosophy. And then, of course, my classic Hollywood books as well that deals with the symbolism in some of your most favorite films. I would also say if you're looking to get into a healthy approach to diet and exercise and living, go to chalk.com, that's choq.com, and use the promo code, as you just heard in the middle of this ad, for any of those products. Those are the best products out there. Remember to like and share. We don't get a lot of algorithmic promotion over here on this channel so it's really depending on you guys to get this stuff out there send this uh, video to the people because i get i get this question every day what are the theological texts that i want to uh, if i want to learn orthodox theology where do i need to start these are the best in my view for theology proper 